it worked. Uh, let's, because I think you are in the presenter mode this week. So, in the chat. Do you mean the Zoom can see it? Yeah, the Zoom can see it. I don't know how I get rid of that. How <laughs> I get rid of that presenter yeah. mode? Uh, swap display. Well, no, in the, in you swap display, then uh, it will, it will, we will see here the, the presenter mode. Yeah, it's fine. It's fine. It's fine. Yeah. Okay. You can see all my secrets. In <laughs> right. Okay. Let's put this. Is it working? Yeah, for the sound. Or for the sound is okay, but if you want in the camera, you need to be around here so that people can see. And the sound is for everybody. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, the sound is. So good morning, everybody. Sorry for the, this uh, late. Uh, Moments, we are ready now. So, thank you very much, uh, Carlos Frank, for being here. We have uh, the talk, a conclusive test on the cold dark matter model. And uh, our director, Anchorande Alberti, will introduce the uh, council. Good morning, and welcome to the IAA Severo Ochoa seminars. Today, we have the pleasure of having Professor Carlos Frank as a visitor to our institute and also as a, as a speaker for the seminar program. Mm -hmm. Professor Frank was the inaugural Ogen Professor of Fundamental Physics at Durham University and continues to hold this position today. He founded the Institute for Computational Cosmology, Durham University's world-renowned theoretical cosmology institute in 2001 and was director until 2020. He's one of the originators of the cold dark matter theory for the formation of structures in our, in our universe. Using some of the most powerful computers in the world, Frank and colleagues try to understand how our universe evolved from the simple beginnings of the Big Bang to the present day, and how it developed the complex structures composed of stars and galaxies that we see around us today. Frank is the principal investigator of the Virgo Consortium, the leading international collaboration in cosmological supercomputer simulations. He has published over 550 scientific papers and with over 105,000 citations, he's one of the most cited authors in the space science area. He was elected Fellow of the Royal Society in 2004 and has received numerous prizes, including, let me mention some of them, the Gold Medal of the Royal Astronomical Society, the Ranford Medal of the Royal Society, the Dirac Medal of the Institute of Physics, the Max Born Medal from the German Physics Society, the Gruber Cosmology Prize, the Hoyle Medal, the George Darwin Prize, the Alexander von Humboldt Fellowship, the Ort Professorship, the Royal Society Watson Award, among others. He was made commander of the British Empire in the Queen's 2017 birthday list. He features re regularly on radio and television. Frick, uh, sorry, Carlos Frank has received over 70 million pounds in research grants during his career and is currently the holder of a prestigious European Research Council Advanced Investigator Grant. He was instrumental in obtaining external funding for two research buildings at Durham, including a landmark building designed by New York-based architect Daniel Liveskind, which was opened in March 2017. Today, he will talk to us about a conclusive test of the cold dark matter model. Uh, Professor Frank, welcome to the AIA, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for that very nice introduction. Uh, it's a pleasure to be in my favorite city in Europe, and uh, Europe is my favorite continent. It's my favorite city in the world. It's absolutely beautiful. I remember when Paco was thinking of moving here from Madrid, I said, why do you need to spend more than a nanosecond? It's obvious <laughs> where you want to. If you get a choice to live in this city, you should. It's a little bit similar to my own city, but nowhere near mine as beautiful as this one is. Right, so I'm gonna tell you about um, uh, the uh, conclusive test of the cold dark matter model. So let me begin with um, telling you, just uh, I understand that most of you are not cosmologists, so I'm gonna start at the very beginning with a um, description of what is lambda cold dark matter. This is my, this is my building. 
Uh, that is the building designed by Daniel Libeskind. It not, doesn't always look like this, but this is just during the opening. We projected some astronomical images on it. So the uh, lambda cold dark matter model uh, is the standard model of cosmology. Lambda stands for the cosmological constant, CDM for cold dark matter. And it's a model that um, was um, proposed in first in the 1980s. And uh, it's an, an ab initio fully specified model of cosmic evolution and the formation of cosmic structure. Because it's so well specified, it has strong predictive power. So this is one of these uh, rare situations in cosmology and astrophysics that you can actually rule out uh, a particular idea, in this case, a model. And um, in fact, it has made a number of uh, fundamental predictions. I will describe some in a minute that were in fact subsequently verified empirically, for example, having to do with the cosmic microwave background radiation, large structure, galaxy formation, and so on. It's been so unexpectedly, in my mind, successful uh, that, that it's fact uh, has uh, won three Nobel Prizes in physics uh, since 2006, and uh, including the 2019 Nobel Prize uh, uh, given to someone whose picture I will show you in a little bit. So let me just summarize the lambda colder matter model in one slide. And um, cartoon of the Big Bang, here's the Big Bang, here's the present day. 13.7 billion years later. And uh, the story here begins very early on, uh, 10 to the minus 35 seconds after the Big Bang, when uh, uh, the universe is thought to have been born, if you like, in a slightly unstable state uh, with some vacuum energy of some quantum field that caused the universe to expand exponentially fast for a very short period of time. And that exponential expansion is known as cosmic inflation. Now, because uh, 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 while the universe gets rid of these excess vacuum energies, it's a very simple description, but because there are quantum fields associated with inflation, there are quantum fluctuations uh, associated with these quantum fields, and these quantum fluctuations get stretched as the universe expands exponentially, and so they stop being quantum objects and they become classical objects, and they see the universe with small fluctuations in energy density, which uh, because inflation is a scale-free process, uh, it's just exponential, there are no scales, then the power spectrum of these small perturbations is just a power law. And uh, it's very easy to show that the slope uh, of this power law is very close to one. It's just slightly below one. Now, the basis of this uh, standard model is that these quantum fluctuations of inflation are the progenitors of all the structure that we see in the universe today which is kind of a crazy thing to say. I mean, you're all physicists and astrophysicists, but when I say this to the public, say, you know, you're the result of a quantum fluctuation from inflation. Uh, it's not something that uh, it's easy to stomach, but uh, that I will show you the empirical evidence for this. Now, so these uh, tiny fluctuations uh, uh, evolve because uh, a little bit later, the dark matter is produced as the universe cools enough, these particles are produced and they produce the gravity that amplifies these small fluctuations. So as the universe expands during the Big Bang, the fluctuations grow. And uh, uh, when the universe is 350,000 years old, then the, that's when the first hydrogen atoms form. So the radiation that until then was coupled to matter through electron scattering, the electrons fall into hydrogen atoms. And so the radiation is free to escape. <coughs> that's the radiation that we see today in the form of the microwave background. And that uh, is the first light of our universe. And it brings us information about the processes that existed at this very early time. Now it was uh, realized, so the first paper in inflation uh, was published, in fact, there were two, uh, by Andre Linde and Alan Guth, more or less at the same time, in 1980, when I was a PhD student uh, in Cambridge. And uh, uh, I remember uh, that in those days, there was something called a preprint, and that was made of a substance that we don't use today called paper. And uh, Martin Rees, who was the director of the Institute, would come in in the morning before anybody else and read all the preprints and put them in a, in a sack. And uh, I remember I came one day, and uh, uh, this is 1980, so many of you probably don't remember much, but uh, now we have inflation, nothing compared to the inflation of the 1980s. And so there's this paper on the preprint rack called Cosmic Inflation. So I thought it was a joke. And uh, so I went to Martin and I said, Martin, is this a joke? And uh, he says to me, 
No, it's not a joke. And tell you one thing: this must be the this may turn out to be the most important piece of paper you've held in your hands. And uh, I think that's not an exaggeration. And that coincided with the idea also around the 1980s that the dark matter, which in the 1980s, not everybody accepted there was dark matter, by the way. In fact, lots of uh, important influential people, um, even our 2019, well, I, I, I'm sure you know who it is, Jim Peebles, even he was not completely sure, but uh, uh, the idea that uh, the dark matter, if it existed, could be made of elementary particles that was proposed in the 1980s as well. And it was soon realized that uh, regardless of the details, conveniently in cosmology, one could classify all these dark matter uh, particle candidates into three families, uh, hot, warm, and cold, whose name, the names here, as I will show you in a minute, reflect the velocities of these particles in the early universe. So the example of a hot dark matter particle was a neutrino uh, of a mass of a few tens of electron volts. And, uh, these particles are relativistic at early times, hence the name hot, at the other extreme, they're cold particles. These are either very massive, like the neutralino, but uh, they're never really relativistic uh, or only for a very short period of time, or uh, weird particles like the axions that are never in thermal equilibrium. So these particles are cold, uh, these are hot. In those days, there was no candidate for, for something intermediate, but now we have a very attractive candidate, I'll tell you more about in a minute, called the sterile neutrino. So that was recognized very early on, and um, the simplification of why you can do this is shown in this plot that uh, shows the power spectrum uh, of fluctuations. So we have this uh, fluctuating field of quantum fluctuations, take the Fourier transform and plot the power spectrum. Uh, these are large scales, these are small scales. Uh, and the inflation, as I said, predicts just the power law with a slope very close to one, slightly less than one. Uh, and then here, there's a suppression of growth during the radiation era uh, because fluctuations just don't grow uh, in the matter during the radiation era. It's well understood. It even has a name, the Mezaros effect. And uh, but then, depending on the nature of the dark matter, you end up with different power spectra. So, for example, if the dark matter is hot uh, and you emit 30 electron volt neutrino, these particles are relativistic until quite late. And so they free stream out of fluctuations. They're moving in 3D, so they wipe out all small scale fluctuations. In the case of cold dark matter, uh, these particles are cold. There is also a cutoff here for hot dark matter occurs on the scale of clusters. In the case of cold dark matter, the cutoff is in Sevilla or in Malaga. It's at, at the scale of the earth of the earth mass. I'll show you more about that in a minute. And then it could be the, uh, uh, the wavelength of the cutoff roughly scales inversely like the mass of the particle. So if the mass is a bit, uh, heavier, for example, KEV instead of EV, then the cutoff can occur on the scale of dwarf galaxies and that is warm dark matter. So we have a completely specified set of initial conditions for from which structure grows. And then all we need to do is see what gravity, we're interested in the dark matter only, what gravity does to this power spectrum. And that's a relatively straightforward problem. Uh, and uh, you need, uh, so uh, you can te test these possibilities with astrophysics because it's totally, totally specified. Uh, and so the way you do these calculations of how uh, this power spectra turn into the universe we see today, uh, you need a computer, uh, not because the problem is difficult, but just because a lot of the scales of interest are non-linear, so you cannot solve the equations analytically. You have to solve them in a computer, doing something that uh, should be familiar to people here, since you have one of the world experts on simulations, uh, uh, Paco, where you uh, have some assumption about the contents of the universe, that the dark matter is hot or cold or whatever it is. And then you just solve the relevant equations. For example, if you're interested only in the dark matter, you just need to solve the collision Boltzmann equation, the Poisson equation, the Friedman equations, and that's it. That's all you need to do. Uh, if you are interested in the visible parts of the universe, then the problem is a lot more complicated because now you need to understand radiative hydrodynamics, star formation, and the whole of astrophysics. I'll show you some examples in a minute. Now, so uh, then you program the computer to solve these equations, and um, it's much, much better than teaching students to do it, because uh, first of all, they never make mistakes, but unless you don't program them correctly, they work on weekends, and they don't take any holidays. So that is a far more efficient way to do it than getting students to solve the equations. And then you see what comes out of your simulation. 
Now, way back in the 1980s, um, the uh, first uh, possibility to try was called Dark Mare. Why? Because there was, uh, these were the days of the Cold War. So we're entering a new Cold War, hopefully not, uh, with Russia or maybe with, with China. But in those days, there really was a Cold War. And uh, you couldn't talk to people in the USSR. Uh, uh, and uh, but news filtered through illicit channels that uh, there had been a measurement of a neutrino mass uh, of uh, by these people, Rubimov, Novikov, and uh, they claimed to have measured a, through a, um, a, one of these double beta decay experiments a neutrino mass of 30 electron volts. That was immensely exciting because we know how many neutrinos uh, the universe has, about 100 per centimeter. If they weigh 30 electron volts, you do the multiplication and it turns out that this was just the mass needed to give the critical density. Uh, omega is this cosmological density parameter, uh, density divided by the critical density, and uh, this would give omega equals one, which is what we all thought had to be the answer in the 1980s. Well, we were very disappointed when we did simulations of what the universe would look like uh, if the neutrinos really have a 30 electron volt because the universes that came out of the computer didn't look anything like the real universe. This was the best, biggest survey of galaxies in the 1980s, the CFA Redshift Survey, with a total of 2,482 galaxies. I know how many because I had to plot them by hand, not, not quite, almost. And, um, but it was enough to rule out the idea that the dark matter was made of, uh, of uh, 30 electron volt neutrinos because you can see reflected in these huge structures that cut off in the power spectrum on large scales that's reflected in these big uh, coherent structures that have no parallel in the universe as we knew it then. It was easy, we rule out hot dark matter. So we set out to rule out cold dark matter as well. Uh, we thought it would be equally easy. And uh, this was in 1985. Oh, sorry, I should say that the first uh, result that came out of this program was to rule out the idea. So the Lubimov experiment had to be wrong. So this is the first example of how astrophysics can inform fundamental physics. The neutrino, there's no way the neutrino could have a mass anywhere near 30 electron volts. So if you like, it was a prediction from astrophysics that has been verified subsequently by experiments that the neutrino had to be a lot lighter than 30 electron volts. Anyway, that was the easy part. And then we said, well, let's rule out cold dark matter too. Uh, and uh, uh, we then uh, carried out just fortuitously, a simulation of what later became the standard model. This was in 1985, uh, and uh, this is exactly what uh, the standard model is today. Now, why did we do a simulation with Lambda in the 1980s, where everybody knew Omega had to be one, and Lambda was some kind of exotic uh, concept? I can tell you in the pub, uh, there's a reason why we did it. It was actually, I can tell you, there was a challenge. Simon White came up to me and said, I bet you cannot solve the equations with Lambda. Uh, and I said, I bet I can. And uh, uh, of course, Simon was always right. So I couldn't, but uh, I then, uh, Simon, between the two of us, we sold them. <laughs> and then uh, we did it just kind of for fun. And then it turned out to be, but not for fun, for completeness, it turned out to be a very um, uh, um, fortuitous, but lucky uh, occurrence. So it was clear just by eye that, that ruling this one out was going to be a lot harder. So uh, that's 1985, we're now what, uh, 37 years later. And I would say all my career I've spent, not all of it, most of it, trying to rule out cold dark matter. And uh, I failed, so I always say my career has been a failure uh, because my goal was to rule out this model and I haven't failed to do it, but now I know how to do it. And towards the end of this talk, I will tell you what you need to do to rule out Called dark matter. I know how to do it finally. And uh, as we go along, I'll show you how it's easy to trip up and get the wrong answer. Now, so, however, what uh, really made this the standard model of cosmology was analysis of the uh, uh, spectrum of the temperature uh, structure of the microwave background. Uh, this was uh, uh, these fluctuations in the energy density from from the Big Bang, from quantum fluctuations, they are reflected in the microwave background in, in homogeneities in the temperature and the density and everything, but particularly in the temperature, which you can measure. So uh, the, uh, the, this is a map of the temperature of the microwave background. This won the Nobel Prize uh, to George Wood in uh, uh, 2000 and, ah, forgotten. See in my slide, but I cannot see it here. Anyway, so 
This map was revolutionary. This is a map of the temperature of the microwave background. Looks like this, it's all over us. It was projected on the sky. And uh, in 1992, it showed for the first time that indeed the microwave background radiation had small differences in temperature. They're tiny. The differences between the hot and the cold spots are of order one in 100,000. But that's exactly what was predicted of 2006. This earned uh, George Murch the Nobel Prize for the. And there was a lot of hype in those days. I remember the newspaper that said that uh, you're looking at the face of God and all sorts of uh, exaggerations like that. Uh, George liked those, those but uh, anyway, so that uh, map was uh, made again with uh, a lot higher resolution, similar sensitivity by the WMAP satellite a decade later. And as I'm sure many of you know, or not all of you know, uh, made quite, with even greater uh, resolution and now greater sensitivity by the Planck satellite uh, just uh, about a decade ago. And that is the definitive map we have of the uh, temperature structure of the microwave background. Now, if that if the theory is correct, when you look at this map, you are uh, looking at nothing less than these quantum fluctuations from inflation that have been, uh, ex ex uh, been uh, stretched by inflation into these uh, classical objects that affect the temperature of the radiation at early times. Now, why this is so exciting is because predictions for the detailed structure of these temperature maps were made, uh, particularly by Jim Peebles in 1982, although the roots go back to, to those papers. So what's plotted here is again, the power spectrum, but now projected on the sky. So it's now spherical har harmonics. Ah, uh, and uh, right, so it's now spherical harmonics. And so this is just the temperature difference as a function of, scale, of angular scale on the sky and um, or, or spherical harmonics multiple. And all, all these uh, structures, we understand exactly where they come from. These oscillations are called acoustic oscillations and they just reflect coherent oscillations of the, fat, uh, the photon baryon fluid just before the universe recombines for the hydrogen atoms form. Uh, they're coupled, they oscillate coherently. Suddenly, as I said before, the electrons disappear uh, the radiation is no longer coupled and it gets the universe vibrating and uh, producing this characteristic pattern, which was uh, predicted in the 1980s in detail by Jim Peebles. And um, uh, here is um, a picture of the great Jim who is uh, uh, won the Nobel Prize in uh, 2019. Uh, and uh, many people nominated Jim, including myself. And I remember I didn't know what to nominate him for because he's done so many things. So I had a list of all the great achievements of Jim. He predicted Big Bang nucleosynthesis, but he's done everything you can imagine. He invented cosmology. And um, if you read the citation, why they gave him the Nobel Prize, it's difficult to know why. <laughs> they didn't give it to him for this plot. This plot alone was worth the Nobel Prize. And uh, why? Because here are the predictions for the uh, uh, power spectrum, if you like, uh, spherical harmonic expansion of this temperature map uh, shown here in green, that's lambda CDM. Uh, and uh, in red are the measurements from Planck. <laughs> and, um, and these are amazingly accurate measurements. The signal is very small, it's of order 10 to the minus five, and yet the data fall exactly where the theory predicts they should fall. So um, I guess everybody here has seen this plot, I imagine. Uh, if you haven't, if you see it for the first time, you never forget it because uh, I, I don't think physics, I don't think life gets any better than that. But I, I say that sometimes in front of my wife and she doesn't like it, but I, I, this is really a high point, not just of cosmology uh, and physics. I think it's a uh, high point of human civilization because you have to wonder why in this uh, corner of the universe or of the galaxy, a species of animal evolved that a capable of making theories about how the universe began uh, and also capable of building machines that they hurl out of the planet that can make these exquisite measurements. So anyway, so um, the, just out of curiosity, is anybody here who hasn't seen this plot before? Can you put your hands up if you've never seen it before? Right, okay. Right, you won't forget it, I can promise. Anyway, so that's what made uh, all that matter the standard model and there's more to it because uh, uh, the model has six free parameters, simplest model. Some of these are physical quantities. So for example, this is the density of variance. Uh, 
uh, the physical density of variance. And we now know the density of variance in the universe to an accuracy of 1%, right? So this is the fourth decimal point here. Uh, uh, that's 1% uh, uh, certainty in the density of variance. Similarly, the density of cold dark matter, we also know it to 1%. And if you compare these two numbers, they're very different, uh, uh, given that the errors are 1%. So what we have here is a 40 sigma detection of uh, non-baryonic dark matter, or cold dark matter, if you like, uh, just from observations coming from when the universe was a thousand times smaller than it is today, at the register of a thousand, which is when the microwave background radiation was emitted. So, the, uh, a tremendous success. We can also measure the curvature of the universe. Uh, that takes a little bit more work, but basically uh, uh, it comes also from the Planck data combined with other data. And it turns out that the universe is spatially flat, again, to very high accuracy. So the total omega is this cosmological density parameter that includes matter, uh, dark energy, uh, so cosmological constant in this case, radiation, that has to be equal to one. And because we know that matter only contributes that much, then we infer, since this has to be add up to one, that the universe must have dark energy, cosmological constant with that value, which uh, was already uh, measured before from the accelerated expansion of the universe. And that won the 2011 uh, uh, Nobel Prize to uh, uh, the supernova team, um, Sol Permuter, uh, Brian Smith, and um, Adam Rees in 2011, they measured completely independently just by measuring the expansion rate of the universe and recognizing that the expansion is accelerating, but here's completely independent uh, evidence for dark energy. Uh, now, so the, we moved a hell of a long way from the simulations with 32 cubed particles, don't laugh, Paco. Uh, and um, in fact, even with, with 5,000 particles, you could do lots of things. So this is a plot that showed the formation of dark matter halos here as function of redshift. And um, it looks, you say today, what? I mean, we all know this, but when, when, when uh, this plot was made, we published it in Nature, it was scandal. And I used to stand up and be, people would throw things at me because I was saying, look, galaxies form by fragments colliding and merging together. I said, what? That is not possible. Even the great Jim Peebles once uh, I was very upset by this. So, uh, so you don't need too many particles to do uh, new things. And, uh, uh, but now we moved on from those kind of cartoonish uh, simulations to this kind of thing. Uh, I've just had a montage here of uh, Virgo work uh, that shows how we really know now in great detail <coughs> the distribution of dark matter on all scales. So uh, I would say, uh, I hope Paco agrees that uh, at least within Lambda CDM, uh, the properties of the dark matter distribution is a sole problem. There's nothing more to learn. We know it all. And uh, for this particular model, I mean, maybe Lambda CDM is not right, but if it is, it's got to be almost right. Uh, and what I mean by that is that we understand the distribution of dark matter on all scales. And I really mean all. I'll show you what I mean by that in a minute. We know the abundance of halos, the so called mass function, how many halos there are of different mass. And we know the inner structure of halos uh, of dark matter perfectly. So what do I mean by that? So let me show you this plot, which uh, at first sight, this is the mass function of halos. Right? The number of halos is a function of mass. At first sight, you say, what's the big deal? It's just a straight line with a cutoff. What's amazing about this plot is there's 25 orders of magnitude on the y-axis and 25 orders of magnitude on the x-axis. So this is the complete mass function of halos of all scales from the mass of the Earth at 10 to the minus 6 to the mass of galaxy clusters. CDM does have a cutoff. But I had a plot, but I don't. At the mass of the Earth, I told you, near Sevilla. And, um, and that is the smallest halos that form are of Earth mass uh, around here, 10 to the minus 6. Uh, and so this, this, I think, is quite remarkable. And uh, we published this in Nature a couple of years ago. Uh, maybe we were a bit disappointed, or maybe not surprised that it was just a straight line. I mean, gravity has no scale, so what else could it be? Uh, and um, so let me tell you how we managed to do a simulation uh, spanning 25 orders of magnitude in mass, you know, from the mass of the Earth to the mass of the comma cluster. So the way we did it, it we took many years, by the way, uh, 
uh, many, many years. And uh, I always say this project, which we call the VVV, for reasons I'll tell you in a minute, we, we managed to break by calling Adrian Jenkins and people who know Adrian, they know he's very difficult to break down. But we not only broke Adrian, we also broke Volker Springer. And that really is the first time in my life I've known Volker since he was a student, that he just was at a loss, you know, what to do. But we solved the problem in the end. Uh, and the way we did it was we start from a traditional cosmological simulation, 500 megaparsecs across. And then we found a low density region like this one, and we simulated that with a thousand times, several hundred times better resolution. So when you do that, so the characteristic objects that you see here, the big lumps are 10 to the 14 solar masses. Now we look at this <coughs> low density region, uh, and then the characteristic objects that you see here are uh, Milky Way-like halos, that's level one. Uh, and we repeat, we find the low density region, we simulate it with uh, several hundred times better resolution. Now the objects you see here, the big lumps are 10 to the nine solar masses, a dwarf galaxy, it's level two. Uh, and then uh, we keep going, uh, level three here, these are 10 to the six solar masses, find the low density region, uh, here is now only 500, what, 300 kiloparsecs across or something like that. Uh, level four, now the mass of these objects is a thousand times the mass of the sun. And here we're about 100 kiloparsecs or less in this volume. Uh, and then uh, level five, we're at 10 solar masses. So these objects are 10 solar masses. Uh, level six, uh, these are 0.1 solar masses, these objects that you see here, these halos. Uh, level seven, uh, we're now at 10 to the minus four solar masses. And then finally, level eight, where we see objects of the mass of the Earth in that dark matter halos of Earth mass. I never in my life thought I was going to do a simulation where the, the typically the particle masses, as in Paco's big Uchu simulation, so 10 to the 10 or something, the particle mass here is 10 to the minus nine. I never thought I would do something like that. Uh, so we did it, and uh, the, on this case, the universe looks very bizarre. Uh, and that's where this comes from. Then you add them all together, and then we end up with the total mass, halo mass function. So now we know how many halos of dark matter, this is in the absence of baryons, uh, the universe uh, would produce if it is indeed called dark matter. Now, previous simulations had only explored this part. So this was quite a uh, big improvement of 20 orders of magnitude in mass, thanks to this clever technique that took us years to develop. Now we know everything then, we know how many halos there are. We also know their structure, and that's been known for a long time. Uh, uh, this is way back in the 1990s, where uh, <coughs> my then Pozo, Julio Navarro, <coughs> plotted the density, now the spherically average density as a function of radius, and notice that uh, these curves for dwarf galaxies and galaxy clusters look very similar. If instead of plotting them as a function of physical scale, you plot them in dimensionless units divided by characteristic radius and density, they all collapse into a single profile. It's called the NFW profile, uh, and um, it, it scales like one over r cubed in the other parts. Through most of it is one over r squared, and then towards the center, it diverges like one over r. So the density profiles are predicted to have infinite densities of halos that have infinite densities in the center. It's called a cusp. Uh, the mass also goes to zero, so there's nothing to be alarmed about. But this is a very well-defined prediction of the um, uh, called that by the theory, again, in the absence of variance. Now, so uh, <coughs> and, uh, uh, this is just for the specialists here. Uh, the, how well does the NFW formula fit? Well, it fits here. You see the residuals. It's a function of radius. Fits to about 10%. And <coughs> in 2008, we came up. I mean, the beauty of this is it has no free parameters. You give me the mass, um, <coughs> and um, I know everything. So you give me the mass of a halo, I can tell you exactly. Sorry. Yeah. This is P. Ah, this, this annoying this university. Is, uh, yes. How do I get rid of this? Ah. Oh. Close. Yeah. We should. Oh, I know how to close it. It's probably the closest in here. Thank you. Okay. Yes, this is uh, one of the many irritating things that happens when you let bureaucrats, bureaucrats deal with your computers. Anyway, so um, it, it agrees to about 10%. In 2008, we came up with an even more accurate uh, fit. Turned out to be a formula that Jana Inasto had used before, 
to do star counts in the Milky Way. It's called the Anastro profile. It has an extra parameter. But then <clears throat> if you're interested in precision of a few percent, then the Anastro profile does that at the expense of a free parameter, which NFW doesn't have. Right, now, so, so that was uh, from simulations of, uh, uh, now, my, now I know I probably have to go back here, right. So that was from uh, simulations in this part of the mass spectrum from 10 to the 6, 10 to the 7, to 10 to the 15. What about these halos? What sort of density profiles do they have? Well, we could look in the VBB project, the risk called the VBB is because it stands for voids within voids within voids. And amazingly, they're also described by NFW, so much so that I'm not showing you here the density as a function of radius. I'm showing you here the slope of the density as a function of radius. And the NFW is there. If you look at the residuals, uh, again, 10%, NFW gives a good match to the structure of the halos all the way to the mass of the Earth. Uh, and INASTO profile does it even better, just to a few percent. So halos of uh, all masses down to the Earth all have these NFW profiles. Um, now, so the key thing is the concentration of these halos. It's very important for a number of applications. This is a concentration mass relation. It's a classical relation in dark matter and halo physics. And uh, uh, before we only knew what it was doing over here. Now we know it everywhere with uncertainties. And uh, these are all extrapolations that many authors uh, made, um, they're all wrong. And uh, including our own, for example, uh, 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 my student, uh, uh, Neto Angelo Neto in 2007, that was the worst. Paco here will stop smiling. He was wrong too. Everybody was wrong. But you were maybe, you'd say less wrong. Less sure. Wrong. The only person who got the right idea was Aaron Ludlow uh, in a paper we did uh, some years ago. But this was not based on extrapolation. It was based on, on model. So anyway, so the interesting thing here is that uh, two things. One is the concentrations of halos are very similar all the way from the mass of, just a little bit over the mass of the Earth, all the way to the mass of galaxies. They only change by a factor of two or so, right? unlike these things that would diverge. And then there's a cutoff once uh, in the concentration, they become less concentrated when you go to really to the Earth mass because of the cutoff in the power spectrum. I tell you lots of, about that, but I don't have time for that. I have other things to tell you. Now, this is very important for a number of applications, in particular for something called annihilation radiation that I will mention later on. So, um, then not only has there been enormous progress in, uh, oh, sorry, before I tell you about that, uh, now we've entered the age of high precision cosmology. I was always a skeptic, thinking we're never going to do simulations to precision of 1%. But now I am a convert, and I think we can. Not only can we do very high resolution, very high precision simulations, we can now do all sorts of interesting things. Like, for example, this is work by my student, uh, Willem Elbers, uh, just published, um, not published yet, I guess. Uh, this is still in, in, uh, in, in, in progress, where we can simulate now neutrinos. And the neutrinos, we now know uh, that they don't have a mass of 30 electron volts. There are limits that come from astrophysics, in fact, or from laboratory physics. And the limit is at roughly about 0.1. So the mass of the neutrino has be, to be less than 0.1 electron volts. Now that means that neutrinos, which by the way, are the only particle of dark matter that we know exists. So the only dark matter particles we know exist here are neutrinos, but they only make up 1% of the dark matter. And now we can simulate them uh, using some uh, interesting techniques. There's papers by Willem Elbers et al. that will tell you how to do it. And here's what the neutrinos look like compared to cold dark matter. Um, I haven't told you about how we do gas and stars. I'll tell you more about it in a minute, but these are the hydro simulations that are now very popular. And um, the point I want to make here is that uh, the techniques are so refined now that we can simulate this really small fraction of the universe, which is actually quite interesting. Uh, because, of course, these are primeval, uh, primordial neutrinos. So now another uh, interesting development in the subject has been typically a simulation is a random patch of the universe. So you just simulate some, some random patch, doesn't correspond to anything in the universe, unless you do something called a constrained realization, where you have a CDN power spectrum, but the phases of the power spectrum are always free. 
So you can manipulate the phases such that you end up with anything you like. For example, you can end up with the observed galaxy clustering according to some survey. So in this case, we're going to use something called the TUMA survey. So all sky survey of galaxies, you can have a CDM power spectrum and change the phases in a uh, fairly complicated way using some Bayesian advanced statistics such that at the end of the simulation, uh, you end up reproducing the clustering or in this case of the two mass survey. Now, this is very interesting because it allows you to fall, if you want to understand how the comma cluster form or the Virgo cluster in detail, you get a snapshot today but with the simulation, you have the whole history and it ends up with something that looks just like the comma cluster. It also allows you to do tests of cosmology without having to worry about whether your volume is representative or not. So this is uh, something that's been known for a long time, but it's now being done in Anger uh, as part of the Sibelius project that's led by my former postdoc, Til Zavala. Uh, and uh, uh, it's based on um, something called the ba Bayesian origin construction with galaxies of Borg. That is the constraint where you, you implement the constraints. And here is uh, some plots that show you uh, shells. So this is the projected distribution of galaxies in uh, but in, in, in shells, this one 10 to 30 megaparsecs, this one 30 to 60. So here, the gray that you may be able to see in the back is the distribution of dark matter, and the red are the observed galaxies in the TUMAS survey, or 2M++ survey. So you can see that um, the simulation reproduces the Virgo cluster, the Fornax cluster. Uh, here are more shells going all the way to 200 megaparsecs. So normal, I mean, familiar uh, structures, the Perseus spices, Pavo, Indus, Coma, Leo, and so on. They're all reproduced and they're all there. So if you want to know uh, how Hercules form or how is this affecting the velocity of the Milky Way or the peculiar velocities, anything, then this will tell you and, uh, uh, and the data are public. So if you're interested in uh, this kind of thing, just ask me and we tell you where to find the data. Here's a plot I really like because this book takes me back to the 1980s. This was uh, a very shocking plot made by the CFA Redshift Survey Marker Geller et al. This used to be called the Harvard Stickman, where people were shocked that the distribution of galaxies looked like this uh, uh, with filaments. And now this is the reconstruction in Sibelius. And you, this is not perfect, but it's pretty damn good. Here, here's this uh, structure. Here's a, is a, is a comma cluster. And uh, it's a comma or Virgo. Uh, it's Virgo, isn't it? <laughs> anyway, so we have, uh, uh, anyway, so, so this works extremely well. Now, I told you about neutrinos. Now, uh, I think one of the goals of experimental physics today is to measure the neutrino background. So we know the neutrinos come all the way from the Big Bang and you have the key players in the cosmic history. We know there's a hundred per cubic centimeter, there are not many, uh, but actually there are people thinking of uh, detectors to measure this primordial neutrino background. Well, here's a prediction that we're about to publish of what you would expect if you made, uh, did such an experiment, uh, you would see pretty much the large scale structure. Here it is on C in CDM from this constraint realization. Here is what it would look like in neutrinos. Now we flip the sign. So bright here means less neutrinos because the neutrinos are like absorbed by the large scale structure, but they still reflect the large scale structure. So when this neutrino background is detected, which I predict will happen in the next 10 years, 20 years, then they should be able to see a reflection of the cosmic web on the neutrinos, which I'm sure will be extremely exciting. Now, so not only has um, simulations improved enormously, so have observations, of course. This is a picture of the Sloan Digital Sky Survey uh, that people here have worked on. And uh, uh, here is a paper we published not quite a long time ago, uh, summarizing the connection between simulations here in red well, on the right hand side, and the real universe as it was known then. So, this is the uh, Sloan uh, survey. This is a stickman to be compared. These are random realizations, by the way, but we chose one that looked close to that. Uh, this is something called the Great Wall. We found some patch of the universe that had a Great Wall. And this is a 2DF galaxy redshift survey. And you can just see by eye how well this works. Now, so, so let me summarize what I've told you so far. Uh, the basic ideas were proposed in the 1980s of Lambda CDM. Uh, and the idea is that cosmic structure forms from primordial quantum fluctuations from inflation amplified by uh, dark matter. Uh, M body simulations uh, compared to large scale structure tell us A, that neutrinos are not the bulk of the dark matter, 
uh, and, uh, and CDM looked promising already in the 1980s, but um, uh, the Lambda actually, uh, I didn't tell you about this, but it first appeared, the CDM theorists were already writing lots of papers with Lambda before the detection of the accelerated expansion of the universe. I can't tell you why in some other time, but uh, it was really the measurement of these temperature fluctuations in the microwave background that established uh, not only that the dark matter is non-baryonic and the universe has a flat geometry, but also that Lambda CDM is a model that represents reality quite well. So here's a quantitative summary of that. Here's the power spectrum predicted by the theory compared to observations of microwave background and galaxy clustering. Here, these were extrapolated to redshift zero uh, using linear theory so that we can compare galaxies to, to CMB. And you can see that the match really is pretty impressive. Great success. Yet, from this, you know nothing about lambda. Why is it there? What is it? Is it really lambda? Is it something else? And you don't even know that the dark matter is called dark matter. Because for example, suppose <coughs> the dark matter was warm, completely different kind of particle, and there was a cutoff in the power spectrum. For example, if the dark matter is a sterile neutrino, then the power, then all the success of cold dark matter would go straight through to a warm dark matter universe uh, because the scales are not probed by galaxy surveys or by the microwave background, they're identical. And so, but from the point of view of physics, it makes a huge difference whether the dark matter is a, is a uh, <clears throat> supersymmetric particle or an axion, or whether it is a stellar neutrino. And we don't know from uh, these uh, kind of considerations. So, uh, 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 so the key uh, uh, scales to worry about if you're interested in dark matter is dwarf galaxy scales. Uh, and um, so, let me just a word about the stellar neutrinos. Uh, they're very attractive particles because not only do they provide the dark matter in principle, if they exist, we don't know if they do, but also they explain why uh, neutrinos have small masses. Uh, and most importantly, they explain why we live in a universe made of matter and not equal amounts of matter and antimatter. So all sorts of interesting things associated with stellar neutrinos, whether they exist or not, that's another matter. Uh, and um, there are claims uh, out there that the dark matter has been discovered already, uh, both <laughs> claims that cold dark matter has been discovered and also claims that uh, warm dark matter has been discovered. So the cold dark matter comes from a strange phenomenon uh, called uh, gamma ray, the gamma ray excess. I'll tell you about that in a minute. Uh, and uh, warm dark matter from an X-ray line in the spectra of galaxies and So let me tell you about this. So uh, it turns out that if, if, the, if the cold dark matter is made of supersymmetric particles, but not just supersymmetric particles, that's one example general class of particles called Majorana particles, these particles are their own antiparticles. So when they collide, they're the same matter and antimatter, the same thing. So they annihilate, and if the mass is GeVs, then they produce gamma rays. And that's called gamma ray annihilation radiation, and it's what uh, Majorana particles would do uh, uh, if, uh, if they annihilate, uh, if they have a mass of a few GeV or 100 GeV. Now, the Fermi satellite, uh, now, many years ago, uh, published uh, this map of the center of the Milky Way, which is exactly where the densities are high, and where you will get this uh, annihilation of matter and antimatter into gamma rays. So the Fermi gamma ray satellite published this map. Once you get rid of um, known sources, this is what it looks like. So there's an excess of gamma rays that uh, uh, these authors, uh, uh, particularly Dan Hooper, uh, have claimed it is evidence of cold dark matter exists and it is annihilated in the center of the Milky Way. Now, uh, separately, there is a, a spectrum in the X-rays. So if the, if the dark matter is a warm particle, a sterile neutrino with masses of KeV, they, these particles don't annihilate, but they decay. And uh, because the masses are KeV, they decay in X-rays. And uh, there's a claim that there's an excess, it's a line here uh, that you can see. This is a Nobel Prize winning line in principle. Uh, at uh, a wavelength of three, well, an energy of 3.57 keV, and there's no plasma physics line known at all in that, that, that particular energy. So it's something either an instrumental uh, defect or it's the detection of the decay of something, and the something could be a stellar neutrino, uh, and it could be the dark matter. And this was going to be tested conclusively by a Japanese satellite called Hitomi, and uh, those of you who know about X-rays will know that that satellite uh, and it's what happens when you rely on professional programmers. The programmer had the wrong sign uh, in an equation, and the satellite was the spin of the satellite. But they have a servo mechanism to correct 
the spin, you have the wrong sign, so you can imagine what happens if you have a spinning object. You try to correct for rotation with the wrong sign, but it was spun until it exploded. And unfortunately, Hitomi didn't manage to test whether this line is there. Uh, there's a successor to Hitomi that uh, will be launched actually next year, uh, and that will tell us whether this line is real or not. Uh, I, I think it's fair to say that most of the community are skeptical for various reasons. I uh, can go into them later, but uh, if you're interested, it's certainly very unlikely that both of them are right. I don't think the dynamic can be cold and warm. Uh, and um, most people would say it's very unlikely that either of these is right. But anyway, there are these claims out there. And uh, how do we, as astronomers, uh, how do we uh, uh, try to contribute? Well, we got to see if we can astrophysically detect this cutoff in the power spectrum. So the key thing here is to focus on small scales, dwarf galaxies. That's why I spent the last 10 years of my life working on dwarf galaxies, uh, trying to understand whether we can tell, but we can rule out CDM. And I'll show you in a minute how you can do that. So now, so the identity of the dark matter is encoded on these very small scales, the scales of both galaxies and the hail of the Milky Way. Uh, this is strongly nonlinear regime and you need simulations. So let me show you how the hail of the Milky Way will form if the universe is made of dark matter, of cold dark matter. So here is a movie that shows uh, the formation of a dark matter halo. Here you see these quantum fluctuations, these small perturbations. Here's a clock, uh, 80 million years. And uh, you see only gravity is just dark matter that you're looking at here. And you see how dark matter, what I said before, amplifies uh, these fluctuations and uh, causes them to grow. It's just purely by gravity. Of course, the expansion has been taken out of this picture. And, uh, but very soon, when the universe is still a very small fraction of its current age, this wonderful, amazingly beautiful pattern it's a small version of the cosmic web forms. Here you see gravity in action. A big object is forming here in the center uh, as uh, uh, lumps attract uh, other lumps and they become bigger when they merge. So here these are being attracted by this fellow, as are these. Uh, they're all coalescing together in mergers. And uh, so this structure forms by something called hierarchical clustering. Small objects form first and then they form bigger and bigger objects. Uh, and this eventually they all merge along these filaments and uh, the uh, uh, flow along the cosmic web. And then uh, eventually this will evolve into the halo of the Milky Way. It's only 2 billion years after the Big Bang, but I'll stop the movie here. So I mean, uh, I'm sure I'm gonna run out of time and show you what the same uh, simulation would look like in a universe made of warm dark matter. So what I'm gonna show you here on the left is the same movie, uh, sped up a bit. And on the right, uh, what it would look like, the formation of the Milky Way like halo in the case of cold dark matter. So you see here, uh, well, you don't see much, uh, too much light, but you see here that in the case of CDM, there are already all these lumps form, but there's nothing in the case of warm dark matter. Well, why? Because the power spectrum has a cutoff. So these fluctuations that give rise to this object don't exist in warm dark matter. So it looks totally <laughs> boring. And there's already quite a lot of stuff going on in cold dark matter. Uh, if we let it run, then eventually, uh, some structures begin to form here because now we're in the part of the power spectrum where it's not zero. Uh, so this lump is the same as that lump. This one is the same as that one. Uh, and um, they, this one is that one. They all come together and merge. Uh, and so uh, in the end, the hail of the Milky Way looks very similar. But of course, there's a huge difference in the small scale structure of the Milky Way halo if it is made of cold dark matter as opposed to made of warm dark matter. So far fewer lumps. So this would be very encouraging. You think, well, yes, yeah, astrophysicists can tell you that the dark matter is called or more. You just need to look at what's out there in the halo of the Milky Way. Well, it sounds easy. Uh, and I'm going to show you now why it's not that easy. Uh, and the reason, is, so the fundamental prediction of CDM is that there should be a huge number. I show you uh, these 24 orders of magnitude in mass uh, of uh, small mass halos. Whereas in warm dark matter, it shouldn't be uh, that many. So how many of these uh, halos? A very large number, and that I showed you that earlier, this uh, power law, um, uh, this power law mass function. Now we can compare that with what we expect in warm dark matter. So in warm dark matter, you only see uh, the, the, um, the bigger, bigger lumps. So here is for, for one of these stellar neutrino models, here's the mass function, but I'm just focusing not on the Earth mass anymore, this 10 to the 8 solar masses, the grays where the simulations don't work well. So it's 10 to the 8 uh, uh, and, and later. So you see here they're identical on scales of the Milky Way and smaller 
um, the LMC is the same, but as soon as we go uh, below, this is a ratio uh, 10 to the 10, you begin to see a deficit of halos in warm dark matter. And then there's a cutoff in this case at a mass of about 10 to the eight solar masses. So here is the way to tell uh, one from the other. You just need to know whether the universe made or didn't make halos of 10 to the eight solar masses. And then you know if uh, the um, cold dark matter is right in principle, or if the universe is made of warm dark matter. So we need to count the number of small halos. Uh, so the first thing you say as astronomers, well, let me count the ones that I can see. Now here's where things get a bit complicated. How many halos are visible? Now, any ideas how many halos are visible? Just a small fraction, unfortunately, because of the way galaxy formation works. So I'm gonna give you a, uh, 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 only these ones up here are visible. So let me tell you why. I'm gonna give you one slide premiere on galaxy formation. So in one slide, I'm gonna give you the basic ideas about galaxy formation. And that's if you, if I'm going too fast, there's a paper I wrote now two years ago with my then postdoc, Alejandro Benitez Lambay. Uh, and it's just very simple. Alejandro didn't want to publish the paper. This is so obvious. Why are we going to write a paper on this? And so, well, maybe obvious to you, but not to the rest of the world. So uh, here's the plot. Uh, here's time, redshift, uh, uh, going to redshift 10. And here's the mass of a halo today, right, at the present day. Now, so, for a halo of present day mass 10 to the nine, what do I need if I want to, a galaxy to grow in it? Well, when the universe comes out of the Big Bang uh, of recombination, the hydrogen is neutral and it's quite cold. Now, how do you get, in order to make a galaxy, you've got to get that gas in a halo to make a galaxy. Uh, when it goes into a halo, if the halo is very small, but the gas won't even notice that there is a halo there. They won't notice any gravity coming from the halo. So the halo has to be big enough in order for gas to fall in, uh, then typically it gets shock heated. And so for uh, neutral hydrogen, the universe here is made of neutral hydrogen to cool, it has to be in a halo larger than some mass. Uh, and the mass is this as a function of redshift. So for a galaxy to form, say in a halo of, uh, of 10 to the nine solar masses today, it has to have a mass whenever this object collapses above this threshold. Otherwise, you just won't be able to cool and the halo will be dark. Then at the redshift of uh, uh, six or seven or eight, the universe is reionized. That then heats the gas, it's no longer neutral. So it's now ionized and, um, and hot because if you ionize hydrogen, you also heat it up to about 10,000 Kelvin. And so now the halos have to be even bigger. And that's that blue line here. And so if we combine the two uh, for a galaxy to form in a halo, if it forms before redshift eight, say, I assume reionization happens at redshift eight, the halo has to be above this line. And then at reionization, the stakes, the barrier gets bigger and they got to be above this mass, right? So if I want a halo to form a galaxy, then uh, before reionization, it has to be above this line. After reionization, it has to be above that line. And so we know how many halos there are. We can ask how many managed to get through this and uh, this is uh, one of my favorite plots because it tells me all I want to know about this topic, namely the fraction of halos of a given mass today that have a galaxy, any chance. I'm not telling you how bright the galaxy is, uh, whether they have a chance to make a galaxy. And it turns out that all halos of mass less than three times 10 to the eight uh, solar masses here, all of them are dark. No way a galaxy could have formed because Hydrogen, whether it's neutral or, or ionized, would have never cooled in a halo like that. Uh, conversely, all halos of mass greater than three times 10 to the nine should have at least one star, typically many more than one. And this uh, transition is quite abrupt. Uh, we check this simple analytical argument with uh, all sorts of simulations with hydro. And so all these different lines are different ways to do the calculation. It's a very simple physics. Uh, uh, however, it's physics that has eluded many people in the community. The Milky Way has uh, known 55 satellites known, uh, and um, here's some pictures of some of those, and uh, uh, there are more than 55, but because the surveys don't map the whole sky, but it's not too hard, and my student Oliver Newton did this calculation together with my former post of Marius Kaltun and others to uh, just extrapolate how many there should be if you had a full survey with an uh, infinite depth 
and it turns out that to magnitude zero, which corresponds to 100 solar masses, they should be, according to this calculation, about 120 uh, satellites in the Milky Way, of which about half are known, uh, with big uncertainties here. So there's about 100, and um, there's hundreds of thousands of halos. And so people who don't think about galaxies, who don't think about physics, uh, call this the missing satellite problem. So I don't know if you ever heard about how CDM is ruled out because of the missing satellites problem. Has anybody heard about the missing satellites problem? Yeah? The only the two of you have been on Paco We invented We invented uh, our paper. No, that was bad. Uh, and more. No, I was clipping. And, with clipping, right. Yeah, well, time, but... right. So, so this problem is one of those problems that, uh, you know, Ibsen's uh, seven uh, actors in search of a play. This is a problem that was solved before it became a problem. Uh, now, the clipping is a bit more clever than what I'm about to say because it doesn't talk about the luminosity, it talks about the, yeah. the VMAX, but that's a bit more interesting. But the, most people in, understand this missing satellites problem as saying, look, there's hundreds of thousands of halos and only 55 satellites. What happened to all these? Well, I just told you what happened to all those. They never made a galaxy. So uh, this argument is completely wrong. And uh, uh, most of halos never make a galaxy. So every time I give a talk, so I'm now old enough that I'm on ERC panels and I'm on this and I'm on that. If you're gonna write a, a grant application or a fellowship application or a job application, if you're gonna talk about missing satellites, too big to fail, just say, please do not send this to Carlos Frank because automatic reject. Okay, so, so if I see something with a missing satellites problem, I don't even read it, it's reject because that is not a problem. That is something that makes me somewhat depressed because these are simple physics. They've been known, in fact, in detail since um, uh, my student, Andrew Benson, in 2002. Admittedly, your paper with Clipping is 1996. 1999. 99, sorry, and Ben Moore as well. Same time, these two papers. Ben was my postdoc, that's why I know yeah. Ben. Anyway, so soon after these guys flagged this, it's in a different version, but let's not get into minutia here. In 2002, and in fact, they were already hints 10 years earlier, uh, and this very nice paper. There were lots of things that happened. And the physics are understood. Uh, CDM predicts only a small number of satellites. This is work from, uh, I said, from the CISO of Andrew Benson. Here in those days, only about 10 satellites were known here in red. Here are the predictions of the theory with lots and lots of scattered here because of small number of statistics. And uh, Sloan then found uh, another, the 50 that I was telling you about. And actually, it turns out that Andrew's physics, simple model, it's an analytic model of galaxy from which predicted about 100, just like uh, we think there are. So this is a problem that we solved in 2002. So why do people keep going back and talking about this? Because I don't know why. Somebody here who seems to be in sociology might tell me, but anyway, uh, people say I go apoplectic when I talk about it, and I do. Uh, one of these even had a heart attack when I'm talking about the missing subject. It's not, there's nothing missing except people's understanding of galaxy formation. Now, anyway, so we cannot do this with full hydro simulations. There's a breakthrough in the subject uh, about um, 2015, seven years ago, several groups. This is available. We did something called the Eagle Project. Uh, there was a, uh, Illustris and several others, more or less at the same time. Uh, here is some images of galaxies that didn't come out of the Hubble Atlas. They came out of my computer. Uh, now, including not just dark matter, but all the hydro and all the star formation and feedback and AGN and all these uh, kind of stuff, it's all included here. Much more complicated than uh, uh, dark matter. Only here is a project which we call Apostle uh, because we had we had five, 12 simulations uh, by this Til Savala. Here is what the local group, Milky Way and Andromeda, would look like if you were lucky enough to be able to see the dark matter, but you're not. So you only see the galaxies. So that's the picture you get because most of these halos are dark for the physics I just explained. So that is what we see and we can count the satellites. And it's of course the same answer as we had before because the physics are simple. For example, for the Milky Way, here is the observed number of satellites. Here are the predictions of these hydro simulations, exactly the same as Andrew Benson had uh, a decade earlier. So more than a decade earlier. So when galaxy formation is taken into account, 
CDM predicts you observed abundance of satellites. There's no such thing as a missing satellite problem in CDM. And unfortunately, uh, warm dark matter is the same, right? Because the satellites uh, form in, as we said, in halos of, of mass bigger than a few times 10 to the nine, where they're pretty much indistinguishable. So CDM and warm dark matter predict roughly the same uh, mass function, luminosity function of satellites. So you're never going to be able to tell them by counting satellites apart. So if you want to do that, then you go get uh, a little bit cleverer and uh, you have to uh, uh, be able to see not just the visible part, they're the same in the visible part, you've got to be able to explore the invisible part of the universe, right? And that is, I want to finish off telling you about the invisible part of the universe and how, uh, going back to my first comments, how we can finally rule out CDM. So how do you see the, these dark objects? We all know how, with lensing. And uh, so we need to count, not the galaxies we can see, but the starless dark halos. And you can do that with galaxy lensing, with a particular manifestation of lensing, which is something called strong lensing. And uh, so it's, uh, the, in principle, it's very simple. I have now been by, I've now been working on this for several years. It's the hardest problem I've ever worked on, which I'll tell you why in a minute. So there's a particular type of lens where you have a source, say a distant galaxy at redshift two, you have a, a lens, say a big elliptical galaxy at redshift point two, and then if the source, the lens, and the observer are lined up, then just from optics, you end up with these amazing uh, uh, pictures that nature has given us of these uh, Einstein rings. So this is the, this is the source, uh, that uh, the light of the source because of symmetry gets uh, uh, deflected into this uh, so-called Einstein ring. So that, you know, they were discovered in the 1990s and it's all really exciting, nobody knew what they were. Uh, soon, but some people did. Uh, anyway, so this is well known, well documented, a beautiful uh, manifestation of uh, general relativity. Uh, but we're not interested in the lens, we're interested in these small halos that could be along the line of sight or could be somewhere. Uh, uh, that, but these small halos also produce lensing. So the light from the source not only gets affected by the big lens, it also gets affected by the things we're interested in. They tend to the A and smaller uh, mass halos. And what they do is they perturb the Einstein ring. So here's a beautiful example of uh, one such uh, object uh, discovered by Simona Vigetti, who's a pioneer well, together with Leon Kupmans of this field. Oh, and uh, the, uh, but this is not interesting. If you see the galaxy, then it's not interesting because it's very massive, right? You can see the galaxy. So this is uh, 10 to the 10 solar masses. So we're interested in the 10 to the eight. So you won't be able to see the galaxy. You have to just detect the perturbation in the Einstein ring. Now that's really hard. And uh, here's some plots made by my uh, student, uh, Chuhan He. Uh, with another colleague in Beijing, Ran Li, and the whole, the whole crowd in Durham, uh, James Nightingale, and several others. Uh, Aris, uh, uh, can't pronounce his last name, even though he's been my daughter for years, he's Greek. It's, uh, um, Ambrosiades, I think this is that. Anyway, so several people working on this. Here's a mock image made by Chuan of a lens. Here's the Einstein ring. And what you do is uh, you have the image, then you try to make a model with no, no substructures, no small halos. It's called the macro model. Then you subtract the image from this model with no, in, no perturbations, and you look at the residuals. And uh, in the residuals here, hidden here is the information of whether or not there are some of these 10 to the 7, 10 to the 8 solar mass halo. Now, Chuhan claims that one can spot 10 to the 7 solar mass halos. Uh, not easy, I can tell you. Uh, you can spot many, but they're all usually false positives. Uh, or at least as, 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 as small as 10 to the 8. Now, the point is that if one dark matter is right, and this is true, that you can detect them, then you shouldn't see any 10 to the 8, right? In one dark matter, the cutoff in the mass function is at about 10 to the 8. You should see zero. See one, and you say the dark matter cannot be stellar neutrinos. Conversely, uh, if CDM is right, you should find many of those. But not just many, I can tell you exactly how many. That's the mass function I show you at the beginning. I know exactly how many of these there are, uh, and they're dark. They've never seen the pion in their life. They've never been affected by a supernova explosion. They are pristine. They come from the Big Bang. They are unaltered. 
They have n of w's, and we know how many there are. So it's a beautiful test. Shame life is not that easy. It tends out to be really hard. I don't have time, so I've run running hopelessly over time, but there's uh, lots of papers that we've written, and uh, we tried many things, some forward modeling, looking not at in, not for individual perturbations, for the power spectrum of fluctuations. And the result is good news, that in theory, if you had uh, a 50, this is for 50, uh, somewhere it says here, well, it doesn't, but it's for 50 lenses with 10 times the better signal to noise than what we have today, you should be able to detect the uh, cut of that. We've already detected, we have a paper just a few weeks ago, uh, James Nightingale is the first author. We have detected already two objects, but um, in something called the Slack sample, is HST imaging, and something called the Bell's Gallery, also HST. Unfortunately, they're really, really massive. So they're the ones you actually see by eye. So at least in, in principle, the method works. It's just really hard to look at these little ones. So lensing will explore this key part. And this is key because there are none of these in one dark matter. Right? And, and I say, we know exactly what many you should see. Now, what about all these? And I'm not gonna talk about that today, but you could see these with annihilation radiation. Uh, uh, and uh, if Pat invites me again, I can give you a whole seminar on annihilation radiation, but I won't because I've already taken too much time. So, but we can test CDM already and rule it out by this lensing observation. So let me summarize what I've been telling you today. So Lambda CDM is a great success on large scales. As evidenced by the cosmic microwave background, that's the structure of galaxy evolution. I didn't tell you about that, but could have done. But uh, uh, that's the success of the theory. But on this scale, lambda CDM cannot be distinguished from, for example, warm dark matter or other forms of dark matter, self interacting dark matter, and all sorts of things like that. Uh, the identity of the dark matter makes a big difference on small scales. So, what happens on small scales? Well, uh, the smallest scale of in CDM out of Earth mass, and uh, I show you how many there are uh, and what, how weird the universe looks like in that on those scales. Now, halos of collisionless dark matter, that is with no variance, they all have this universal NFW density profile uh, on all scales over 21 orders of magnitude in mass. Uh, well, this is a technical thing near the cutoff. Uh, free streaming reduces the halo concentration. Fascinating physics, but I didn't talk about that. The mass concentration relation. I didn't tell you about this either, so let me skip that. It's independent of environment. You might say, well, your experiment with this BBB was very weird, but we've shown that actually the results are quite general. Uh, all halos of mass less than 5 times 10 to the 8 are dark. Uh, all halos of mass 5 times 10 to the 9 should have a galaxy in them. And so if you want to probe the universe on these scales, there's no way you can do it other than lensing. So, uh, 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 so, so, um, let me stay here and wrote this on the airplane, so I don't know. Um, uh, yeah, all halos 5 times 7 have a galaxy, uh, but because these don't, there's no such thing as a satellite problem in CDM and warm dark matter. Distortions of strong gravitational lenses over a clean test of dark matter and can potentially rule out the whole paradigm. So uh, I think we'll see what happens. I was very enthusiastic about this uh, five years ago when we started working on lensing. It's really tough. So is anybody here who really likes statistics, who really likes to get uh, uh, noisy data to give information, drop what you're doing, go and work on lensing because the rewards are huge. You could rule out the entire Lambda CDM paradigm or uh, you could rule out any other rivals to the theory. And uh, I stop here then. Thank you very much. Thanks. Now the talk is open for questions. How Prada will manage. So for the participants in Zoom, please uh, raise your hand and we can turn between this one. And the okay. One. So, Thank you, Carlos, for a beautiful talk. We really enjoyed it. Um, so any questions, uh, comments for Carlos? Uh, yes, please. And yes. Uh, before going into details of the gravitational lensing, you said that there were claims about how you can check that the matter was cold or warm. And I didn't catch the uh, uh, long dark matter. What was the argument? This uh, yeah. experiment, can you comment? Yeah, yeah, sure. So, so, the, 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 uh, so unlike these Majorana particles that annihilate, uh, the, these particles, the stellar neutrinos, could be unstable. In fact, most all particles are unstable at some, with some lifetime. But 
for some models of, uh, of uh, these uh, stellar neutrinos, they decay on a astronomical time scale. But, and so when this um, a stellar neutrino decays, if the mass is, is kilo electron volts, that's in the X-rays. And so the decay will produce a line at a particular wavelength, which is just twice the uh, mass of the particle. So uh, the uh, so, so the half, sorry, the mass of the particle. So if the mass of the particle is seven kilo electron volts, then the decay will produce a line of 3.5 keV. And um, it's just the decay line, right? And so it's like an emission line. And that line has claimed, has claimed by very reputable people that that line has been seen, not just in one object, but in a collection of galaxy clusters by a group in Harvard, Babu and collaborators, uh, and also independently by uh, a theorist, actually, Alexei Boyarsky uh, and colleagues who look for that line, not in clusters, but in galaxies. And they claim to have seen it in Andromeda and in some other galaxies. And so there's quite a lot of evidence that that line exists. Now, then there's a big debate whether the line is really a decay of a stellar neutrino or is some instrumental defect. And um, so it's been seen in two instruments in, uh, in the X-rays, in XMM and, and, uh, uh, and, and, and um, the other one, uh, Chandra. And the, uh, so, but the technology is similar. So it could be a spurious line. It could be due to some, some people argue some complicated uh, instrumental effect that gives you something that looks like a line. There's a big debate, or there was a big debate. The debate kind of died out because the satellite, the Japanese satellite that blew up was supposed to measure these lines with great accuracy. He told me, uh, and now we're expecting for a, a new satellite um, called uh, 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 XMAS that will um, fly anytime now, but not now, the next year, early in the spring. And that should then determine whether the dark matter really, whether the stellar neutrino really has been found or not. Okay. So that's what it is, yeah. What I'm missing here is uh, if they became formal, there are a couple of questions on the standard model, and the other thing is that there's no standard collection of pieces. So why don't you? Yeah, you good question. It? Right. In fact, you could say, why can you make it uh, with, with, uh, with uh, beta decay, right? So, right. So there is the Katrine experiment in, in uh, somewhere in Germany. Uh, when I talk to particle physics, I have a picture of Katrine being deployed in this small village and uh, being put in, brought into place in a big truck that doesn't fit in the houses in that small village. So I always make a joke that if the houses were a bit more separated, they could make a bigger experiment that would then be able to make a stellar neutrino of this mass. But because the experiment is small, uh, it doesn't reach the sensitivity needed for these high masses. So, so Katrine uh, will, um, look for, well, we do beta decay, try to measure the neutrino mass, but uh, also would look for stellar neutrinos, but not in this mass range, an order of magnitude too low because the, the instrument is just not big enough. And uh, she's a shame because the theory, well, for it to be dark matter, uh, it, it's completely less massive, but then we've already ruled that out because if the mass of the stellar neutrino to say, you know, one keV, then remember the wavelength scales inversely to the mass. So the uh, cutoff would be on very large scales. And so there'd be no satellites at all in the Milky Way. So we already know from astrophysics, when I talk to these guys, I say, look, don't bother. They're already ruled out at the right abundance. Of course, there could be a stellar neutrino that has completely different abundance and, uh, and not, not interesting for the periphery of dark matter. So that's, that's the reason why it's just the technology is in principle there. Uh, I don't, I'm not a specialist at this, but I think the, um, it gets harder and harder the more the massive, the more massive the particle is. So yeah, so, now there is a proposal to do something in CERN. Uh, in fact, Alexei, I just mentioned Boyarsky, he's proposed an experiment in CERN that um, hasn't been funded yet, but that, that would actually make them in, in, in one of the colliders there. So this Boyarsky, so the main, the first person who thought about this was uh, an amazing guy called Misha Shaposhnikov, 
So if you, you're a part of this, you probably heard about him. He is um, the first person to propose uh, phase transitions in the early universe that would give you the matter and antimatter asymmetry. So he's the one, together with Alexei, was his student and others, uh, who uh, come, come up with this proposal in CERN. So there are plans to try and make it, either in, in the laboratory or in a collider. Good. I think we have one question on Zoom. So Renee is going to read it for you. Yep. Uh, it's on YouTube. Yep. Felix uh, Mirabel. Uh, oh, Felix. Yeah. Hello, Felix. <laughs> I haven't seen you for years. I was just thinking about you the other day and uh, your experiences. Where was it? In Prague. But anyway, we'll talk about that some other time. So he wrote it. What can be inferred with the LCDM model from the existence of black holes of 10 to the 9 solar masses and redshift red 7, around 7? Right. Inferred on the formation of the first galaxies. Well, I, uh, Felix, I think what you infer is they're there. I'm, I'm a skeptic. Uh, I think it's very easy to uh, get enthusiastic and overestimate the masses of these things. So, but, you know, as you know, uh, since you pioneer some of these subjects, that uh, the uh, masses are estimates from uh, using um, scaling relations at other masses. But if they're there, what I learned is that superadding token accretion occurs. So that's what I learned, right? That uh, in order to make such an enormous uh, black hole at high redshift, then you go to accrete everything you can and not be limited by uh, the Eddington limit. Now, so then in detail, whether there are halos massive enough to allow even super Eddington accretion, that is a quantitative question. And uh, so the people who've done these calculations, uh, they would, I think uh, like, um, Ah, I just forgot. I can see his face, but anyway, I'll remember the name in a minute. Would argue that you can only just make them at the highest observed wretches, but it's very, very hard. And so my, and, and you need super Eddington accretion. So my take on that is that if you lower the masses by factors of a few, which is within the errors, then everything works fine. If these masses really are accurate, then, then I don't know what it is because uh, it would, you know, like these JWST galaxies. I mean, how on earth can somebody write an article? Well, I hope there's nobody here. On a galaxy at Vecchi 14, or was it 16, of 10 to the 11 solar masses. I mean, that, you would see it in the microwave background. You would see it everywhere. So uh, I, that's, that's my take, that uh, uh, we have no evidence from the CMB on, on very small scales or from anything else that, um, there are these great big objects. Uh, uh, maybe you say, well, it's outside the range that you can test with the CMB. But so, so I think it's at the limit. So short answer is uh, these black holes are at the limit of what is doable. It'd be much better <laughs> if the masses were exaggerated. But if of, of that kind of order, uh, you really have first line evidence for super Eddington accretion. So that, that's that's what I would say to your question. Good. Thank you. Um, we come back to the real uh, slide here. Uh, is there any more questions uh, or comments or comments? Okay, I think uh, I have one question regarding your expectations from Euclid for the legacy statistics. I guess you have already plans to explore it. Yeah, yeah, no, well, yeah, I'm so pleased. I, I, I think Elon Musk is not my favorite character by a long way. But the fact that Euclid has been rescued by his company and will be launched next year, it's great news because I'm not getting any younger, right? And uh, Euclid is going to produce hundreds of thousands. At the moment, the biggest sample is this. Uh, uh, Bell's lab and the Slack sample. The Slack sample has like 30 or 50 or something like that. Bell's gallery, the same number. So, and, and they're not, not equally good. Uh, Euclid is going to produce hundreds of thousands of these that they won't necessarily have the uh, uh, image quality you need. But if you have 100,000 and you can persuade someone that you're going to rule out CDN, surely they'll give you time in JWST or HST to get better imaging. And so the future is very, very rosy. And so uh, unfortunately, the time scale is also long, right? Because if Euclid launches next year, there's still another year of commissioning, et cetera, et cetera, and there'll be three, four years 
uh, before you get these 100,000, and then maybe you have to follow them up. So it's a kind of program that would last a decade. I'm not sure I'm going to last a decade. Well, you're, you're still young. So <laughs> I'm getting older yeah. by the day. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. Yes. Okay. Oh, there's another question. Yes. yes. More, more or less the same thing. Juan Miro. He, Who is yes. Juan, Juan Miro. Uh -huh. Will the mission be able to. Not Juan Miro. No, no. <laughs> Uh, will, will the mission Euclid uh, help or be able to differentiate between color matter and world matter through laser? Right. So, yeah. So, so I think so, so the, you know, the main kind of Euclid uh, thrust is on, on clustering and uh, on trying to understand the dark energy on large scales, which of course are not uh, where we're going to be informed about the nature of the dark matter. So we will learn a lot about dark energy with Euclid, I hope. For, for dark matter, the, the, the lensing is, is the way to go. And, uh, and the weak lensing doesn't, well, the weak lensing helps indirectly because to understand the strong lensing in great detail is good if you also have weak lensing. But the weak lensing data on its own won't really do much. It's a strong lensing regime uh, looking for these uh, small lumps. And yeah, Euclid would be terrific. It would be great because it would provide uh, these large samples. And I haven't lost, faith that if you, even if the image uh, quality is not as high as you can get with JWST, if you have a hundred thousand, you can do lots of things. So when I said you need to follow them up, maybe you don't, maybe with a hundred thousand, if we get clever enough, then we can find ways to extract these signals. Uh, I mean, there are lots of people doing all sorts of things, you know, wavelets and this and that to see whether you can uh, extract the signals just from the Euclid data. And so at the moment, I don't think we know the answer, but it's not out of the question. So, so if that's true, you know, the time scale gets accelerated and it will be in five years time, we should know whether or not um, CDM is ruled out. So yeah, now that I, I have lots of um, uh, hopes for, uh, for Euclid. All right, so if there are no more questions, so thank you very much again for your uh, talk and uh, visit. Uh, let's thanks again, Carlos. Thank you.